Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart, truly, 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 to all those who have helped to support this podcast and to keep it on the air. What I want to be able to do now is to mention our two new subscribers. For $10 or more, you join what's called the shout out tier. So we do a shout out for you. Thank you to Amy and thank you to Camilla for your support. And it means so much. It truly does. I am so grateful to people who want to add their names to those who are supporting our podcast and maintaining it as a free, accessible service to anyone who needs. And to the people who have now been donors, who have been supporters for a number of months, I truly appreciate your ongoing support. That is also incredibly meaningful and very, very valuable and necessary. To Stephanie, Sheila, Holly, David, Donna, Michael, Zofia, Katrina, Peter and Cynthia, Camu, and Maureen. Special, special shout out to all of you. Today on the show, we have Zoe Skrletis. She is a young professional who is currently based out of Austin, Texas. For most of her adult life, Zoe battled anxiety and depression. And in 2017, she lost a close friend to suicide. She longed to do something to bring awareness to the mental health community. So in October 2019, she launched a mental health podcast called Solace in the City. Through authentic conversations about sensitive subjects, she works to open up the conversation around emotional wellness. Her goal of the podcast is to reduce the stigma surrounding depression, anxiety, loneliness, and suicide by sharing these powerful stories. It is wonderful to have her on the show today. It was also great to be interviewed on her show, Solace in the City. And she's going to talk to you about promises, a promise she was given by someone who was trying to recruit her actually into Nexium, who told her that she would be able to be cured of an issue that she had that certainly could not be cured by Nexium. And so we talk about how you address these sorts of things, but also what to do about all of the false promises and how to detect them. Here's Zoe now. everybody. I am very excited to have Zoe with me today. She's someone who had invited me to be on her show, which I want her to be able to talk about because I love the name of it and I love the content of it and different guests that I checked out, of course, before I went on, but I think it's great. And I also really value the fact that you're coming to wanting to uncover and research and explore certain areas, not just kind of in a journalistic way, but really coming from a place in your heart, a personal way. And that is very powerful. So take it away, Zoe, introduce yourself and maybe talk a little about your show and also what brings you to this subject. Definitely. Well, first, thanks so much for having me. I love being a guest on podcast because I don't get to do it very often. So it's really fun. Um, but yeah, my name is Zoe Skirletis. I'm 25. I started my podcast, Solace in the City, back in 2019. And really, it was a very spontaneous decision in terms of creating the actual podcast. But the subject, which is mental health and kind of holding space for vulnerable conversations is something that I always really valued and 
appreciated. So when I did decide to start a podcast, that was the theme I immediately went with. And yeah, I've always been passionate about mental health because of having a history of various mental health related illnesses and disabilities during my life. Um, and then I also lost a very close friend to suicide in my senior year of college. So that was a big turning point in my like life, so to speak. And I really wanted to make conversations that were somewhat taboo. I wanted to reduce that stigma because if no one's talking about these kind of things, then no one's being heard and people deserve to be heard and listened to. So yeah, and it's been the most fun thing I've ever done. I'm fully in the mental health space and working for talk space and um, having a podcast and hopefully going to a graduate school for social work eventually. So very nice. People out there listening, if you are interested in doing this kind of work, there aren't a lot of places to go to be trained. There's a program in England with, by colleagues of mine and it's at University of Salford, an, an amazing master's program you can do virtually. I know, though, that I get contacted by therapists, social workers, psychiatric nurses and psychiatrists and others to try to figure out how to address this, how to deal with it, because they just have not gotten that kind of training. A lot of people who are kind of these frontline people, when people come to their office, they want to know how to address these sorts of issues. I think from your experience, you're going to have a lot of insight and a lot of sensitivity about how to approach this. So I do hope that within your future social work profession, that you're going to be able to be a resource because there are a lot of people out there who really, really do need it. And I'm very sorry to hear about your friend in college that there's no way for that to not make an impact if you have a heart. And I think also for the idea of suicide, there's so much about that that is about feeling truly hopeless and stuck. And again, I come across that a lot with the population I work with who have been made so miserable in the groups they're in, but have also been told or convinced that they don't really have a place to belong in the world outside. And so they feel the only way out is to end their own lives. And it's quite awful. It happens way too often. So back to your story. So tell me a little bit about moving into what some of your experiences were, what you were hoping to be able to get some help with, and what happened next on your journey to get this help? I'll give like a spark note summary, I guess, because I've definitely had a long list of things that I've gone through. But essentially, in fourth grade, I was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome, which pretty much affected me my my entire life. Um, and is the one thing, I mean, I talk about everything I've been through on my podcast, like whether it be my previous eating disorder, my depression, anxiety, et cetera. And like Tourette's is something I still like get a little like butterflies in my stomach saying out loud because it's just plagued me my whole life for social reasons and just being a sensitive person and having, you know, growing up with everyone asking me why I was doing my tics, which mostly were blinking and just on and on and on. So it was something I went through, like I went through my whole life dealing with. And then I have been taking like medication for it, but it did the whole like tried treatment, try the homeopathic stuff. Then finally went to medication, Botox, like it's crazy, all the things that they do to try to fix it, but there's no cure. Then my sophomore year of high school, I was at a boarding school and we had a, like a speaker come to speak to my school named Mark Elliott. And I remember walking into the auditorium and seeing that it, like the subject of the speak that the speech was what makes you tick. Cause that was the name of his book, like talking about like Tourette's and something. And I literally ran straight to the nurse's office. And I was like, I'm sick. I don't feel well because I, I did not want to listen because I thought oh, if I listened to this speech with these, because I was new at the time, I was a new sophomore, all these people are going to like connect the dots and be like, oh, that's what Zoe does. And I just, I couldn't take it. So I went to my room and pulled up my computer, Googled Mark Elliott and just watched all of his videos. 
and basically essentially watched the speech from my room. And when I watched it, I was like, wow, this guy's amazing. He's so vulnerable. This was back in like 2011, I want to say. Yeah, 2011, 2012, maybe, where he was just kind of promoting his book. And I just thought he was like the coolest person ever. Uh, meanwhile, my my mom and my parents, like that same, in that same month or something, coincidentally went to a speech given by him at a local community college and got a book for me that was signed by him. So I come home from my boarding school and they're like, we got you this book. I'm like, he spoke at my school. That's so weird. And I, I like, from that point on, kind of idolized him. I even wrote one of my college essays about that experience, like about not going into the auditorium because this basically the whole notion of like pre disposed like ideas of people. Then fast forward, I'm in college, my sophomore year, which is pretty much, I'd say like the tipping point for when my depression really got bad or like started to be honest. So I had reached out to Mark Ellie. I don't even really remember why I'd reached out to him. I think I just was like, I'll shoot my shot. Just like see if he wants to talk to me or just express my like gratitude for him. And then I received a phone call a couple like, or a voicemail a couple days or weeks later from him saying, got your message, would love to talk to you about, I just would love to connect with you. So I, I of course, freaked out, texted everyone in my family, like, oh my God, Mark Elliott, reached out to me, blah, blah, blah. And then I hopped on a Skype call with him and he started telling me about this program he had found. When he first gave this speech in high school, he was very clear that he still had Tourette's and you can't get rid of it completely. It doesn't just disappear. And he just got really good at hiding it and really good at like basically pushing the ticks into like other areas of his body. So you couldn't really notice it, but he, he made it clear that it was a lot of effort. And when I spoke to him on Skype, he was saying how he was completely cured. He didn't have to hold on to those urges anymore. Like he was a new person. And it was all because of this gifted program thing that he was working at. Was this the executive success? Yeah. Yeah. ESP. Right. Yeah. Executive success programs. Yeah, exactly. Thinking about it now, it's like, was I an executive? No. Like, was I getting success in any way? No, I was just trying to not blink so much. So he's like telling me all about this program. I'm like, oh, like, sounds cool. And he was like, it's great. It'll, it'll change your life. I'm thinking, you know, maybe this is like an odd thing I could do online during my free time, whatever. So he asks if I want to have another call with my parents to learn more about it. So then I get on a call with my parents who obviously witnessed me battle with Tourette's my whole life, know how much it's completely just taken over my mental health. And they're on a call and he's talking about the program and they're interested. He says how much money it is and like, God bless my parents. They weren't even deterred by the insane amount of money it was. Ultimately, he, it was going to make me have to miss school. And I'm the biggest nerd in the world. And I was just not going to leave school. I had a crazy major. I mean, my parents were like, would you want to? Would you consider it? And ultimately, I said, you know what? Like, I need to get my degree. I need to. I have already had switched majors, so I was a little behind on work. So I, I turned it down. And never heard from him again. And then fast forward, I think it was last year, beginning of 2020 or 2019, when this all the Nixium cult got mentioned, I get a call from my mom and she's like, have you heard about this cult? Nope, not really. She's like, guess who's connected to it? Mark Elliott. I was like, are you serious? And I obviously watched the stars documentary and just seeing how passionate he was on the show it was like I don't know it was really just disheartening because I looked up to this guy so much in the beginning and then like seeing how he could kind of use my something that obviously like he got bullied for his Tourette's his whole life so like he knew the pain that like I went through socially and physically with my similar experience. 
So to see him kind of like weaponize that, I guess, or like make it a like bait was just a really crappy feeling. It's a very hard feeling. It's a this sinking feeling. And you know, I know that this that this podcast isn't necessarily about Mark Elliott, even though that that was your connection to this particular group that now people have heard of. You know, Nexium and the the show Seduce that you're mentioning on Stars and other documentaries about it and books that are coming out about it and have come out about it. It feels like what you're talking about is being promised something and being given the sense that here you're going to be able to get involved in something and it's going to either cure you or, or relieve you of so much. And then, and you're going to want to trust it, especially if someone says, it's what helped me. I'm wondering also when you were saying that you would have had to leave school, you mean permanently or take a leave or what was told to you? I think it was something like a 12 week program. It was like a long, long program. Um, but he's like, you know, but what, you can always go back to school, but when else can you heal and like all of that stuff? Wow. Okay. I think about that too, about all the people who have been told to leave what they're doing uh, and leave the path that they're on in order to follow these promises. And that once people drop out of school for an extended period of time, there are studies about how they don't go back. And some do, but it's more rare because then you just get busy doing other things or it's hard to know that you're behind and where do you pick up and and I think also when people get involved in something like this ESP program they'll sometimes really get involved in it like they become part of it or they then become instructors or something that becomes their life yeah i'm pretty sure that was the case with with mark i'm pretty sure i don't think he was one of the, like the main recruiters i think he was more leading classes and i think he actually believes in it which is the weirdest thing okay and so then he told you what that you said he could move his ticks to other parts of his body so that's a like actual coping mechanism for Tourette's is like when you get like the urge to tick like if i had like a neck tick to kind of like squeeze your hand or something that's less obvious so that was the original sentiment in 2012, which is true. But the whole, like, I am completely cured was what he told me in 2016 on the Skype call, which in hindsight is a huge red flag because it's just not possible, <laughs> especially for someone like him. Um, like, I'm lucky where I don't have very, like, I don't have what you would consider stereotypical Tourette's where you like scream profanity on the subway kind of a thing. Uh, there's a special name for that. I'm forgetting what it's called, but that's what he had. So he had a very like worst case scenario of it. For that just to disappear is sketchy because like, you can't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, when we talk about people who present things in that way, that something cured them of something. It is true that sometimes they do believe it. And sometimes also they've been taught to interpret what they're doing in other ways. So they don't see it as such. They might not call it a tick anymore or something. There's sort of a change in language. So it becomes kind of a murky picture. What do you think as you, you think about kind of his presentation of it? And again, I'm generalizing it also to everyone's presentation of it when they say they're cured of something. What do you think gave him that impression? It's tough to say because, I mean, it's tough because when he gave the presentation in 2012 to my school, I granted I didn't go to it, but, or if I, um, I heard from like, friends and from watching his videos, like he could very much suppress his tics. Like you couldn't really tell. So, and then when I Skype with him, same thing, but I just saw like Kira. It's tough, but I mean, I imagine it's more of the latter where he, he probably was equally as cured as he was in 2012, but who knows, maybe like the excitement and adrenaline he got from work, like this new hustle kind of preoccupied him so that he wasn't doing as many ticks or so that he call, would call it something else. Yeah, it's really tough to say. And like, 
at the end of the day, I do, I feel bad for him because I, I think he probably was roped in for a similar reason. Like he's a very charming person, like personable, good public speaker. Like he had all of the qualities to make him a good, like recruiter slash cults leader, but I don't think he's a malicious person. I think they just utilized his, like, he's a good looking guy. He can, has this incredible story. He was like the perfect piece of the puzzle to get other people like me, who at that time would never have talked about my issues to join this insane cult. Right. I mean, I, I think, you know, when you're talking about someone being charming and you know, I know that there are people out there who are, and I think he is one as well, who are motivational speakers. They're very good at getting people excited about their idea and believing their idea. I think for some people it's ego and for other people, they really care. And I have to assume that he comes from a place of caring. And at the same time, I wonder about again, not not speaking about him specifically, but other people when they will say, I had a really horrible case of something and this group fixed it. Of course, you, you're going to be very moved by that and persuaded by that. And sometimes it is the case that people have a serious case of something or another. And but sometimes it isn't that it was so serious or so symptomatic. But there isn't a way to verify that. Yeah. It's interesting too, just like thinking about what I do with like my podcast and you know, what you do, where it's like, I mean, I, for example, persuade people to go to therapy and I encourage it all the time, but I don't say this is a fix all solution. And it is coming from a place of like love and an empathy and wanting people to get the help they need. So it's really like gross to see people using those same tactics for a malicious reason and to just it devalidates like what you and I do and so many others do. And I think that's kind of another just part that really stinks. Right. Yes. The other part about, you know, when you're involved in a system, when you are doing PR and you're, I think, trying to uh, recruit for a particular group, there are plenty of people who have talked to me who were top recruiters in a lot of different organizations, including this one, where they have said to me, I really wasn't sure that this was what it said it was. And, or I hadn't yet seen it for myself, but I still had some idea that maybe it was good. And I was just really good at recruiting. I was also really pushed to do it. And I knew that it would move me up the food chain within a group if I got a lot of people in and that that's someone who is on the fence. They're usually the ones who, after they leave a group, they feel the most guilty that they were really unfortunately good at their role and successful at bringing a lot of people in and then sometimes couldn't get them out when they got out. But there are other people who really are true believers. And it's, I want to say, yes, it's their responsibility that if they're the ones who got people into that idea, but it's not necessarily their fault because, you know, when we talk about Nexium, we can't not talk about Keith Ranieri and Keith Ranieri was the ultimate recruiter and charismatic person that I guess there is something very magnetic and kind of hypnotic about him and his influence. So it's hard to know sometimes if the next people in line, like the ones who go out and recruit, are just as kind of controlled and victimized as they're going to be helping other people to be. Yeah, it's such a weird process. And I think in Mark's case, at least like from the Stars documentary, and I think he even defended Keith in the trial. So I think he is one of the people that really believes it, or I don't know, because I'm sure, you know, I don't really know how trials against cult work, but I'm sure that people who did feel bad and went to the, on the side of the prosecution would either have some sort of incentive, like both an incentive because they're a good person and realize what they did was wrong, but also like, I don't know, maybe it's monetary. So to go and defend someone 
knowing, you know, that it's, this is in the media, that it's very out there, that this is a cult, like what do you think it is? There must be something in your brain that's completely changed. Yeah, right. I want to be able to ask a couple of questions, but I didn't know if there was more that you wanted to just talk about, about your story. I was curious just about the emotional impact of that roller coaster of being promised something and having it not be made possible for you. And then I'll, we can go on to my next question. So go ahead. I mean, honestly, I think because it was my decision not to do it, it didn't really impact me that much as in like kind of just went about my life being like, well, that was weird. And luckily whenever that was, you know, when it came out, I wasn't drastically affected because I was in a good emotional space. If anything, it just made me be like, wow, this is really interesting. But I mean, I'm certain, I feel very, very fortunate that, that I was putting school first and, and even just, it makes a lot of things be put into perspective, like that I had the opportunity to be at school at that time and be in a place where my academic, like my academic experience is something that I wasn't going to take for granted. Like I was going to go through with, I mean, I'm pretty sure my parents would be pretty pissed off at (laughs) Keith if they just dropped like a ton of money (laughs) on me not (laughs) getting saved. So, but yeah, I, I'm lucky that it's not something that has affected me long-term. You were lucky enough to already be on a track in your life and you were not kind of in between things or floundering or feeling desperate or feel like you had tried everything and nothing was giving you a sense of happiness or capability in your life. You had things already and you had the wherewithal or parental pressure or whatever it was to stick with it. And right, our conversation would be very different now and your life I think would be very different emotionally and in a lot of ways if you had followed his advice. And so it is a really important message, really important message that there is something that kicked in for you where you thought it's not smart to make this decision, even though it sounds like on the other side with the recruiting part of it, you were told by him, there's only, this is your chance to be healed. You know, school will still be there and you can go back at any time. So there was a sort of flippant way of looking at it, but also almost pushing you to reprioritize what was most important. Is that what came across? Yeah. And I think if this had happened around, I want to say 2018, like and when, I, when I graduated, um, I had about, I graduated May and I didn't start my job until September. And that was also just the lowest point of my life, like very bad. If that happened then, I would have gone straight to that ESP program. And I'm sure, you know, been told, oh, not only will it cure your, because I kind of, it's kind of now going back to me. I remember like, you know, mentioning like him mentioning that also it cured his like depression and anxiety was all for all these things. It's just as insane that, you know, one program can, it's like not a one size fits all kind of a deal, but I'm sure I would have convinced my parents to pay so that I could go because all they wanted was for me to be happy and healthy. Right. When people say, you know, what kind of person, they ask me what kind of person gets involved in something that turns out to be cultic. I can talk about certain personality traits, but it's not even so much a a what, a what about them, but it's so often a when. And that people are going to be vulnerable at certain times in a way that they're not as much at other times. And so I think that's why there's so many cults that do their recruiting on college campuses and in near hospitals and in prisons and in front of counseling centers and places where people are going through a transitional time, leaving their family for the first time or dealing with new stress or being diagnosed with something or being incarcerated or being in this in-between place where their life isn't on track or totally stable yet or totally set yet. And unfortunately, it's a very vulnerable time. And especially if you're approached by someone who seems very enthusiastic and really has the answers and it just feels, I think, very secure. Yeah. I'm wondering because I feel like if there's ever a time where (laughs) there's been zero security in in terms of like 
job losses and all of that. It's been this past year. Aside from the major cities where social distancing was super enforced, I'm curious to, to I mean, and scared to see if in more like rural areas, cults have developed because people lose jobs, you know, they're being told to isolate. One person comes and says, come here and you don't have to stand six feet apart from people. You can not wear a mask. Like things as simple as that probably would persuade people back in like last March, April, May. Mm -hmm. It's happened in big cities, but it also to a great degree has happened in a lot of rural areas where things are a little more sparse and people are struggling more and really working hard for not as much to show for their lives and, and all that they've done and not having the funding to be able to keep their farms going and the stress of all of that. People are going to be much more open. Unfortunately, from what I've seen in terms of trends, uh, getting involved in more Bible-based cults, wanting to sort of give over their belief to this uh, higher power that will protect them, and also multi-level marketing, so that if you just buy all these products and buy shelves and for your garage or your barn or whatever, and put your all your all your new products in there and sell them, you'll make your millions. And also in a lot of conspiratorial and radicalized thinking. I'm feeling really disempowered. I have reason to be. I've been forgotten about or, you know, this, my life has gotten really, really hard. I want to feel powerful. I want to have a sense of, like, I have my finger on the pulse of what people are up to. And for a lot of people, it's really very empowering. It doesn't help them in a practical way. It helps at least temporarily in an emotional way. But unfortunately, they usually sort of wind up still where they were before and less so that they've usually spent a lot of time on these things or money on these things, or especially even with Bible based, they're often tithing huge amounts. And in order to get back, you know, this, what is it? The prosperity principle, just the more you give, the more you get back. So it's a really good point. Yes, it does happen in these areas. Those are vulnerable areas. It's true. I'm curious now, as we're talking when you were using the word red flag before, you know, that when a promise was made and you said, you know, or, or a statement was made and you said it was a red flag, from what you've seen, from what you've experienced, what are some of these red flags that people really need to watch out for? Knowing, I say that also knowing that it's a huge drag because we want the things that we're being promised, the magic to be true and to be real. And when you see that it might not be, it can be devastating. You can feel like, oh, this was my last chance to be cured of something, which it usually is not, but it's presented that way. So people sometimes don't want to see the red flags, but they're so incredibly important, if not hard to see emotionally. But in retrospect, from your experience and just what you've learned, what are those red flags? What are things to watch out for? For one thing, just being promised that everything will be good because at the end of the day, progress is not linear. And I think that's something, you know, that you'll hear from therapists. That's something that you'll hear from nutritionists, grief counselors, from anyone. You're going to have like, you have a good day and then things are going to suck again. So being promised this will cure everything is a huge red flag because if there isn't, granted, who knows, maybe people are getting a little smarter about recruiting now and saying, you know, there will be tough days at ESP. If there isn't anything that's not great, that's a huge red flag. Obviously, exorbitant amounts of money is a red flag. That's something I didn't even like think of because like, you know, so are in treatment programs for eating disorders. So are like a lot of things like having zero flexibility in whatever the, let's say, I mean, I'm just referring to programs because that's what, you know, I was being recruited into. I was, I was like, could I do it online? Could I just come for a week? Could I do that? No, you had to come that whole time. There was no real reason as to why. So that's a red flag. So getting my parents involved was weird because I feel like most, I mean, I don't know, this is just at least from my knowledge. I think that was something a little more specific to the Nixium cult of like getting the parents involved. But 
that almost that made it like less weird if they'd been like don't tell your parents that probably would have been a red flag but yeah I mean it's really tough to say because some of the things like being promised that you'll be happier like that's kind of a thing of therapy and of like a lot of things that are good but I think just knowing that ultimately recovering from anything is going to be a long process and painful and may ultimately be good is the true story like speaking to someone who's, you know, gone through depression, anxiety, eating disorder, suicide loss, like none of those were just easy peasy, like went to one therapy session or one nutritionist or one brief program and I was cured. Like, no, I still cry about all those things every so often. Overall, just being told that everything will be perfect because of one thing is just an automatic. Don't do it. Or do your research or find something else because it's just not possible. Uh, That's such good advice. It is true that if it's not this sort of magical promise that then is going to wind up leaving you either disappointed or just so derailed. Because what happens sometimes is that sometimes people will go into an organization in order to fix something, in order to achieve something. And years later, they'll be asked that question, you know, so did it help you with this? And I, I see sometimes this look on their face like, oh yeah, that's, hmm. That is actually why I got, I have been so busy doing other things now and learning other things. And I've been sent on this path and that path and this taking this class and this potion or whatever else. I think people get so distracted and caught up in a group that they will sometimes not even sit back and notice are the things that I was promised coming true? Or am I told that I'm not there yet and I have to keep trying or taking more classes? And is that the way they've got me to stay? Yeah. It's interesting. Have you seen the WeWork documentary? Yeah. It's a good one. It's just so, the world is so weird that like, even like watching that, I'm like, that was like a cult. Like, it's just, it's so wild just seeing where, how these things transpire in literally every aspect of life. But it's nice to know that there's also good people. <laughs> right? Isn't that good? Yeah. And I think that's why these groups, even though there are many more groups than we hear about, and I hear about new ones all the time, uh, still the reason that they're newsworthy is because this isn't happening everywhere and not everyone is a cult leader and not everyone is, <laughs> is out to capitalize on someone else's needs and, you know, difficulties in their lives. And yay. So glad. I mean, it, it, that it gives me hope sometimes when things are still newsworthy because they're not the norm. Yeah, exactly. So thank goodness for that. (laughs) So I think just as we're finishing up, you know, sometimes people do get very dissuaded when they feel like they've tried many things and nothing's worked and then they're offered a promise and turns out that that might have been false. I'm wondering just for yourself, how you have been able to manage your Tourette's and other issues and still move forward because you have definitely done that. You have a podcast and you have put yourself out there and you're a resource and you're going to be probably continuing on with more schooling. And so you're continuing kind of undaunted. And so what have you needed to do or say to yourself in order to do that? I think that's helpful information for people listening. It's funny because I went from being very quiet about all of my issues to having a podcast where I literally publicize everything I've ever been through. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's, I don't know, I think what's really cathartic about it is that for so long, I've been explaining myself to people, like explaining why I blink so much or explaining why I mysteriously was away for a summer because I was recovering from eating disorder, like all these things. And just speaking them into a microphone and letting it out there. I'm like, okay, now I don't have to explain myself if they want to subscribe and (laughs) get the answers they can and and support my podcast. But I think just, so basically talking about these things doesn't have to be on a podcast, like doesn't have to be 
sober public, but whether it's with a therapist, with a friend, not only is just really relieving, but it's also, it holds you accountable. And I think having someone who really trusts you to know that you're going through something, but you're working on it and you're going to continue working on it is so important, especially, you know, I'm, for me with like an eating disorder, that's like a very, that can come back later in life and it's always going to be kind of there. So publicizing this to the world and, you know, my friends listen to it. So to my friends, that's a way to just, I don't know, it makes you like hold yourself accountable in some ways by telling others and being open about it and sharing in a way that's, that you don't even know will help others because so many people, especially now are going through tough, tough things. So when I have someone reach out to me and say like that podcast episode, like really resonated with me or really touched, like I also went through that, or I also had this, or I also had that. There's no better feeling than realizing like, wow, I actually help someone because of my past. So even if you're going through something and nothing seems to be working, I think talking about it with someone or sharing your story will give you that empowerment to just keep going because someone will have a similar, someone will be able to relate. Yes. And you don't find that out until you say it. And then you get that feedback. Like, oh, I'm so glad you said that. I have the same experience or I have, it's a little, it's a little easier for me or it's worse for me or whatever it is. But I'm sure you've gotten feedback like that too, which is really wonderful. I can't imagine that you haven't because a lot of people sometimes are waiting to hear someone else say it first, right? Like, oh, good. Zoe said it. Now I could say it. Uh, yeah. I'm like, I will fully be the the guinea pig here. <laughs> like, I'll talk about anything if it means someone can feel like they're not alone. That's wonderful. Well, I... I truly appreciate you and the, and the work that you're doing and the work that you've done also to get to this place in your life. And where can people find your podcast and whatever else you're doing? Yeah. So my podcast, Solace in the City and the City Not In, I always kind of mumble it, um, is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere else you get your podcasts. And on Instagram, it's just at Solace in the City. Um, and yeah, my name is Zoe Scarlettis. Thank you to you and I wish you the best. And if there is a time that you want to be able to come back on or talk to me again in whatever context, you know, we can certainly do that. I think it's, it's wonderful that you're doing what you're doing. And I'm really happy that you were able to avoid something that I think in retrospect, you know, would have derailed your life, not furthered it. Yeah. 100%. Thank you so much for having me. You are very welcome. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much to Zoe. And just before the one more thing before you go, I want to thank everyone who has helped to make this podcast such a success and to thank the patrons, the people who support it financially, who help to keep it going. And I know you've heard me say before, if you've listened to this before, that I pay for it out of pocket and I do everything I can to keep it on the air. And I really do need to partner with you to keep that going because I don't have sponsors. I don't work for another company. This is just me trying to offer this as a public service. And so to be able to keep it on the air and to keep it as a resource that people can listen to for free. And people will say that sometimes even while they're in a cultic group, they can sneak off and listen to this podcast as a free resource to help clarify what they're involved with, even if they're in an abusive relationship, to help also embolden them and give them a sense about what they deserve and what they don't. And if they're involved in a cult or if they're not, just to be able to get a sense of understanding their life and learning from the guests about how you break free. I really, really want this to be able to continue. I love that it's made its way around the world, which is very gratifying. And I hear from people all over the world. And again, for them, for all of you, I would love for you to help me out, to help the podcast out, to help the listeners out. Go to patreon.com slash indoctrination. 
and offer any amount you can just to be able to keep it going. It can be a one-time donation or monthly. And you also get some merchandise to thank you and a weekly check-in, which is my thank you to you, kind of a five-minute gift, some extra thoughts that I had that I didn't put in each episode, but I saved just for the subscribers, the patrons. Thank you again. Please go to patreon.com slash indoctrination. And now, one more thing before you go. Thank you so much to Zoe for talking about her experiences, for talking about what it's like to grow up having Tourette's, having really anything that you think sets you apart or makes you feel different, makes you wonder about being judged or stared at, and how open you're therefore going to be to getting some relief from that, wanting to cure it, wanting the symptoms to go away, wanting to be able to have your life be different, and then to have someone come in and make you that very promise that you'll be cured. And as the person from Executive Success Programs, part of Nexium, said to her, you will absolutely be cured. I mean, that was the word that was used. And I think when you're given a promise, an absolute promise, it feels so good. There's something quite intoxicating about it. From a very young age, we want to hear people say that they promise. Do you tell a friend a secret? Do you promise not to tell anyone? And if they say, okay, you usually will say, I need to hear you say, I promise. There's something so powerful about that word. Same thing with parents. I promise I will always love you. I promise that I will be there for you to the best of my ability. I promise. I promise. So what we want to make sure is that the words that we hear and the words that we say when it has to do with a promise are really things that the other person is intending to keep and that we're intending to keep. It shouldn't be that you have to even sign a form by way of promising. Your word should be enough. But I know in this day and age, sometimes words aren't enough and we need to get things in writing. And so now people know enough to say, can I get that in writing? There was a book written in 2008 by Herbert Schlesinger, and it's called Promises, Oaths, and Vows on the Psychology of Promising. And it is a whole analysis of promises and oaths and vows. And one of the main conclusions is something actually that he said was reached by neither social nor developmental psychologists, but that he found through his research that making and keeping a promise could be a, if not the, defining act of moral maturity. I love that because I do think that a promise should come with a mature attitude, meaning I have to make sure that I can back up my words. I don't want to give anyone false hope. I don't want to make what are called empty promises. One of the things that has become clear if you define promises according to the dictionary is that it's a declaration that one will do or refrain from doing something specified. Or it's a legally binding declaration that gives the person to whom it is made a right to expect or to claim the performance or forbearance of a specific act. So as it continues, when we don't keep a promise to someone, it communicates to that person that we don't value him or her and that we've chosen to put something else ahead of our commitment. And it says even when we break small promises, others learn that they cannot count on us. Tiny fissures develop 
in our relationships marked by broken promises. And the other psychological piece is this, that not only are we communicating to the other person that we really don't value him or her, that we don't mind kind of sending them on a wild goose chase or having a false sense of security, but we're also telling ourselves that we don't value our own word. And that actually breaks down self-esteem. Of the people I've talked to who know that they made false promises, who know that they followed things like within the Unification Church called heavenly deceit or heavenly deception, where they could lie to people, tell them what the group really stood for and what they were raising money for, but it really wasn't true, in order to get them in, in order to keep them in, and that it was all somehow allowable because you were bringing them to a higher spiritual place so everything would be forgiven. That is a very dangerous situation, dangerous psychologically. You want to know that someone follows by a certain code of ethics and that their word matters. But within a cultic system and within a manipulative relationship, a promise is given and never intended to be kept. And one of the ways that you're going to know that is if you do the following thing, and I urge you to do it. If someone says, I promise, and it's not someone within your immediate family where you've already learned to trust them, it's not a best friend from wherever where you've already learned to trust them, but it's someone new to your life and they make you a promise, then I want you to ask, what happens if the promise doesn't come true? What if you promise me something and it just doesn't happen? What if you tell me that if I buy this book and read it or take this course or date whomever, I will be happy or I will be loved or I will be cured, but then it just doesn't happen? Then what? And I want you to listen for the words that are used in their response. If they use the word you instead of I, you want to start taking steps backwards and away from that person. Meaning, if you ask, well, what happens? You make this promise and it just doesn't come true. And they say, I, oh, well, that would mean that I was wrong about this and I will feel really guilty and I will learn from this and I shouldn't have made that promise and I will feel bad and I will learn my lesson not to say those things because now I've seen that I thought it could happen, but maybe it doesn't, and maybe it won't cure this that you have or make you ultimately happy or saved. That's okay because that's a person showing moral maturity. Not only are they taking responsibility, feeling regret, feeling maybe a little bit of shame, and also learning for the next time not to do that. If instead of saying I, they say you, you want to be very suspicious, and that's when you want to back away. If they say, well, that's because you didn't try hard enough, and that's because you didn't believe enough, and that's because you didn't show enough commitment, or that's because you didn't bring in enough members, or that's because you weren't really feeling it in your heart, or that's because you didn't, I don't know, open up the spiritual pathways in order to really receive that message, or that's because You said that you really loved me, but you didn't really mean it, or whatever it is, it's on you. Then what they're saying is, I know that I can promise you anything. And if it doesn't come true, I can blame you for it and get you to blame yourself for it. Always be careful and always watch out for the pronouns. Look for I instead of you when it comes to a promise and blaming anyone for it not coming true. Stay safe out there. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.indoctrinationshow.com.
www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.